Bueno, pues mientras esto va arrancando. Eh, This starts up. Buenos días a todos. I'll just say hello to everybody. Gracias por estar aquí. Thank you for being here. Gracias a la organización de la I would like to thank the organization of the Rooted for presenting something. Uh, and uh, along my line. So it's an honor for me to present this year because the 10th anniversary of the Rooted, so it's a special edition. I uh, have to thank Rooted for introducing me in uh, cybersecurity. My name is Gonzalo Carracedo, also known as, known as Batch Drake. I work as advisor in uh, the Department of Innovation. And when I deal with many crazy projects, you could say that's my contact address in case you want to send me a hug or any comment or whatever. So my interests are mainly in reverse engineering. These past few years, I've tried to go a bit beyond that. And I was interested in the radio. And now I'm really focusing on in reverse engineering of radio signals. So I get this radio signal. I'm trying to get as much out of it, assuming that nobody is giving me information about this <coughs> signal, about what it means. So, what is the reason? What is the topic of this chat? What you see here is a US drone called Lock Martin RSQ-70. This drone, around December 4, 2011, was going around and flying around the north of Iran until then, until suddenly they lost contact. So they say, the, the Americans said, wow. So on December 8, the Iranian government comes on TV and uh, shows this image saying that our, our cyber war in unit of the Iranian army was able to intercept the control signal of this drone and got it to land con in a controlled manner to capture it and reverse engineer it, etc. And uh, so the military said, oh, oh. Then, why is this interesting? What I was saying, what the government of Iran was saying is that the army had carried out um, an operation with signal intelligence to understand the language of command and control between the drone or the unmanned aircraft and, and the U.S. Department of Intelligence to kidnap it and get hold of it and um, uh, check it out. So, uh, many comments can be made about this. So I thought, well, let me think of a scenario which is not as delicate because, or sensitive, because if you talk against the Americans, you may end up in, in the Caribbean, and not precisely on holidays. That's why I have to show you the disclaimer. This presentation is about techniques used in reverse engineering of radio signals. Whenever there is an individual with more power with you, they will say, you can do it, I take uh, the liability. I, I can give you satellites, and I can talk about space things. What is this presentation not about? This is not about watching TV for free. This is not about stealing connections from neighbors or listening the tetra communications in some frequencies we all know about. In, in short, it is not about infringing the law. In case you don't know, this is the general law of communications of Spain, where it says very clearly that if you intercept a signal that is not destined to the general public, that is a very severe infringement, and a severe infringement can be punished with fines of up to 20 million euros. Is that enough? 
Aha, it vale. gets even worse. Es, es mucho peor. It gets Porque even a lot worse because eh, pongas, ejemplo, even though you listen in to one of the weather satellites that broadcast in open frequency and uh, even they uh, give you the frequency on the website of the weather channel, it is not entirely legal to do so. And I found out this last night when a friend of mine over dinner said that asked me if I knew the novelties in the law and he sent me a very interesting document which is this here and I recommend you read it which makes it crystal clear that what we can do in Spain which is totally legal is to listen into radio broadcast array signals FM etc and uh, citizens band. The rest is no, no, no. So, I've, have I instilled fear in you? Okay. Let's see now how we hack the radio signal of a Russian satellite. The signal of this Russian satellite let us assume that this satellite is called Meteor NM2. We only have these two images, which is the isometric projection of the device and a photograph uh, the, uh, published by the Russians uh, manipulating the uh, satellite. The, this satellite is a public uh, Meteor MN2 of uh, several public services, satellite images of what it can picture underneath in analog and digital open channels. Particularly, I'm interested in the RPTT low rate picture transmission, the last point, which is the digital uh, channel sending images of what it is seen. This is an, an a heliosynchronous orbit, which means that the satellite is orbiting at a low orbit and goes around the world, around the planet, several times a day, passing through the same place at the same solar time. This is done because when you have a weather satellite, you want to know how things are going in your area, maybe once or twice a day. The rest of the time is indifferent, or indifferent because you make the forecast for the following day. And this, this information is very brief and very immediate. So you can have a satellite like the Meteor set, which is stationary and offers round-the-clock services. But with a small satellite from Russia, you don't want to send a satellite, a geostationary orbit, because that is very expensive and it's a waste of time, fuel, money, etc. So this is just to give you an idea of the offers, the R RPT of the Meteor satellite produces. I don't know what this picture, uh, what it corresponds to. Anyway, this service is documented extensively and intensively by the IITP, the Russian Telecommunications Office, and it tells you what you have to do, how to get the signal to get uh, in infrared, in red, in blue, etc. And the L LRPT standard is public, open source, free access. There's loads of documents and examples. So, in addition, the bandwidth is small. So. With a sort of a relatively cheap device, you can pick up its signals easily. So, let's talk about the radio signals of LRPT. This is a known format, a known standard, a known channel for transport. I will just give you some information which you need to understand now, maybe later on. It's user. Uh, Solomon 255, 233, an uh, additive scrambler, convolution coder, two bits per symbol, gray code, modulate, phase modulated, 72 kilo board, transmitted at 137.9 megahertz. So, okay, so far, so good. I implement my things and I get the image from the satellite according to these parameters. So, this is the fact. 
Now, let's become this. Let's make this a bit more interested. Let's suppose that the ITP is formed by images, and it says, "I have this satellite, and I give you LRPT services." But you have to consult this information from my website. And I don't want you to know in what frequency it operates or the, the speed at which it sends information, not the modulation, not the code, not the, not the scrambling or the ECC or anything. So if you are a mean guy, you say, I want to receive the images the way I like. Mother Russia can put things that are not there. So, uh, so this is when our reversing appears, and let's see how we can do to jump over on this black cloud of uh, secrecy. The first thing we have to do is to estimate the frequency in which this satellite works. So I can know what to fine-tune my radio to. In the case of LRPT, this is not very critical because these services operate usually in the same frequency, but this in, that's in general. But uh, in the general case, you see an antenna, but this is not the case. In this particular band, the UHF and VHF antennas uh, that are used for it, the shape and form is closely linked to the frequency of operation for which they're designed. However, the only thing we have here is the isometric photograph of the set of, of of the satellite and its scale uh, compared to humans. So. If I measure this with PowerPoint, I will get that the satellite measures like five seventy meters high, and the uh, operator was uh, one seventy. So, so the satellite is one point eighty seven times higher than the operator. Well, the operator is Russian. Important data. Important piece of information. In 2014, the mean height of Russian men was 176.5 centimeters. So I estimated the body of the satellite in the area of 3.3 meters. Significant. So, second data of interest. This is another is asymmetric uh, picture. Measures you, we can measure with a PowerPoint, and it gives it like over four meters. This antenna is a bit suspect, and I assume that this is what is sending the weather uh, um, information. So the set the, the antenna is 4.84 times smaller than the set. So by a rule of three, the antenna measures 68.2 centimeters long. The rest of dimension is a bit more difficult to calculate because due to the isometric projection, all distances are distorted, etc. So I get that the antenna is uh, between uh, 0 0.5 and 0 0.8 uh, times higher than, uh, than deep. So this antenna is a quadrifilar helicoidal of full wave of right circular polarization. Why do I know all this? Because I know about antennas. The thing is that these antennas, their shape and size are closely linked to the frequency on which they operate. So this page, this URL, that uh, allows you to, on the base of the data that you have, you can know the dimensions of the antenna. As I want to do the opposite, I try different dimensions with different aspect proportions until I find one which is close to what I have measured earlier. There's a lot of dispersion in the measurements because the image is uh, not very good, so I get a frequency between 100 and 130 megahertz. So let's leave it at that. Now we know that it transmits in just over 100 megahertz, 100 and something. So now, let's see, I have the measurements, and now let's see to the hardware shop and say, hey, Jesus, he, he, he takes me to do all the shopping. 
we have a copper tube that I can double or bend, uh, angled or weld uh, the flux, welding flux gloves, etc. A PVC tube for the mask, the coaxial cable, the uh, connectors, the screws, the drill, the cobalt uh, bits, uh, everything, is, all the rest is just uh, a bric a brac. This is what I learned to do while I was doing mecano when I was a child. It was nice. So the result is, well, the result comes later. We had to connect this to a CDR radio. I connect the I, IMI or LIME because the LIME has a large dynamic range which enables me to discern between weak signals and strong signals overlapping. And it works very well. So this is the antenna after implementing our uh, skills our manual skills, but it was a total failure because maybe I must have missed some kindergarten class. Did I, do you remember I told you that it was a right circular signal, but it turned out it was left circle. So I made an antenna particularly efficient at rejecting the signal I was trying to capture. So then I said, OK. Relax. Let's see what I can do. What we see here is an aluminium blanket. And Jesus knows what I'm talking about because he was there. So when we get a polarized signal and is reflected by a conductive service uh, signal, the polarization is reversed and it goes to the other uh, direction of circling. So this was a disaster because all these bounces and the wrinkles in the blanket gave different signals and uh, were totally uh, useless. So I had to invent a new antenna. And this is some, the way it would work. I have made any captures. That is not me. No captures. Is that clear? And he's got a. Uh, I never wear jeans. So, uh, this is more or less what it would look like. So, let's see. I've managed to get the capture of data. As of this point, I will not uh, comment anything I captured there, but I will comment about a radio signal that someone that someone sent from Holland that had an LRPT that was very similar to the satellite we're targeting. So let us see what we were captured. But remember, 20 million euros fine. So, how do we analyze this signal? We, I use this software which is called SUSTA, which I've been developing for a number of years, which is a tool for reverse signal engineering. You send me a capture, and by means of various estimators and statistics, etc., you get modulation parameters that otherwise you wouldn't be able to determine, such as rate of uh, symbol, number of phases, adapted filter, equalizers, stuff like that. I would just like you to see that it is in GitHub. I uh, presented this tool at another Congress, uh, Starcom. I'm sorry about the advert, but it is about radio, that Congress. Well, there's no competition here and no advertising. I will talk about the mathematical details of this in greater detail. So if you want information about this tool, you go to the Starcom uh, website. So you estimate the, so here we have the captured signal from the SUSCAN. This uh, yellow in purple, this signal in purple shows the uh, range. What I, as I don't know anything, what I do is um, try to analyze with a PSK. 
Okay, we have the stationary signal that is sending at 76 kilobaud per second. Extrapolating the signal, I see that the uh, signal has four phases, so it's a PSK. So it allows me to synchronize and uh, start getting symbols. So if I analyze the histogram, uh, I uh, see that I'm receiving errors, which is great. It doesn't mean that there are no errors, but they're well filtered. So I can see, as we have just four symbols uh, in any combination, it is likely that every symbol will encode two bits. And now that you see there, that kind of static sign would represent all the strings. Symbols numbered from 0 to 3 that I obtain by measuring the different faces at different time points. So thanks to Suscan, we know that it runs at 72 kilobouts, that it is a model in phase, and that it uses two bytes per symbol. Now we have all the, well, we forget about waves and all that, and now we say bye-bye to analog and we move on to digital. So when you come to this point of signal reverse engineering, so here we want to find out about error correction codes, scrambling polynomies, um, the size of the uh, strings, then synchronizing sequences, and now we have these variations of the phase over time. And before that, I will tell you about forward error correction. This is something which is widely used in satellite communication, but in with any type of communication, radio communication, and it is naive to assume that there will be no communication errors. So instead of saying, look, this has been badly received, please repeat it. So it anticipates, it forwards the errors by including redundancy. Repeating the bits will be one way of introducing redundancy, but there are other uh, more effective ways to do that. There is a um, high presence of linear codes. Doesn't really make sense to go deeper into it, but let me tell you that it's a trans uh, linear transformation using a finite body, and that they are defined in two main groups. The block code, where you get the flow that you want to transmit, you break it down in the blocks that you want to com transmit, then you add a matrix, a rectangular matrix to them, and as a result, you get a bigger block with more bits in them. Those extra bits are parity bits, and they have the redundancy that is needed to correct errors at, during reception. So convolutional ones are slightly different, but they also function based on linear transformation. They take in one or more bits for each time lapse, and they keep them as records of the traveling, including all the bits. History does a linear transformation, and then it returns three or four bits. The output bits depend on all the input bits that have gone up to or having uh, inputted up to a certain depth. So this is not important at all, so I just don't want to uh, confuse you. So lots of literature is out there about how to blindly analyze a signal that we get at the output of a coder, whether it is block of convolutional. And getting the blind transformation that would allow us to recover the original bits. So there are two key people here, Antoine Valenbois and Melanie Magasin, who researched this aspect in depth and produced a number of papers. They identify, they could see how by analyzing the bits to help us identify blindly the convolutional encoder parameters. And this is the tool that I wrote as a result of that, CC Crack, which is a practical implementation of all that. I will soon upload it to GitHub. And the Crack 
the, the following, the, the tool does the following. It's like seeing all the symbols and then it starts to see all the correlation between the groups of bits and the symbols. When you have a constellation, for instance, order four, no problem. However, when the order is eight, you have an eight factorial uh, possibility. So, so in the case of four, no problem, it does it perfectly all right. But for each tagging, algorithm is applied to find in linear uh, redundancies from all the bits that are received. And it tells you whether there is any convolutional uh, element which is a candidate. And does that blindly with no information whatsoever. For me to treat this simply and not to get any headache, a headache it allows you to put all the uh, results into a file, a file for you to later manage. So these are all the symbols that have been entered. And now here, the results are two candidates. These two candidates have been chosen for the following reasons. It tells me that this is a candidate because it is a great code. In general, frequently adjacent symbols, when they are tagged with a specific bits, the only thing that differentiates them is one bit. So for instance, if I make a mistake when I'm measuring this phase, and instead of measuring this phase, I'm measuring the previous phase or the following phase, instead of making an error of two bits, I'm making an error of one bit. And this is very, very frequent in digital communication. So that's the reason why it is returning only two candidates. And why am I believing that this is true? Notice that these two candidates come in with two different taggings. In the first one, we see some kind of an order, whereas in the second one, we see the previous bits from the previous tagging, but in a different position. What it does that, it tells me that it finds the same uh, polygamy generators. It tells us how convolutional works, but they are placed in an inverted order, which really makes sense, because if I get the output bits and I invert them, it is like getting a convolutional transformer and then to invert the polynomials that generates it. Therefore, I just believe it right away. And what I do now is that to get all the transformed bits, and then I write a decoder to decode the convolutional transformer. Then I apply CC crack, and then because it returns only a few errors, so I can say, well, I got it right. If there are no mistakes, I'm fine. But if there are many errors, well, I may decide to do something else. And now going back to what we know up until now. We know that it uses a convolutional code with rate 1 to 2. Then it one bit is received and then returns to bit. K7, polynomials generating the sequence are 9, 1 and 1 to 1. OK. Now let us find the pattern here. That person's name is Armando. We refer to him as master. Oh, pattern, rather. So there is a good fun story behind all that. So this person is very much like Sudo, but he's a person. If you go and tell him do, and he does. And he does that with 500 threads. OK, what is this uh, part of my presentation about? It is about finding a pattern and then to feed an even Alexa with it. And let me explain this. In many cases, any flow of digital bits that you're sending in any digital communication is zip divided, divided in threads. When those threads come in a fixed uh, size or have the same size, so what we get is periodicity, that is to say a pattern that is repeated every n number of bits which at the same time continues to be very, very common. And what does that mean? It means that if I want to find periodicity due to this thread by using self-correlation, I can nearly be certain 
every how many bits I get this repetition. So then I wrote this tool, self correlator this is a script in Octave, and then it requires little human intervention. It allows me to see the most likely repetition. It tells me that in the bit flow that I got after the convolutional transformer, every 1,822 uh, bits, there is a repetition. That number is a power of two. I very much like the power of two. And probably, well, the size threads which have power of two are also very common. So those peaks that you see there that are so high and so far from the level of noise already tell you that the significance of what has been found is quite significant. And what do we do with that? Well, I will get all the bit strings and I will chop them out. And then I give them all the values, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then I will chop them later on. And because I don't trust that that much, I take all those files with 1,822 bytes. I put them in an image, and I represent them like a mapping of bits like a map of bits. You may notice that when you see this as an image, this is like a gray image, doesn't really make sense. But on the left, we see kind of a pattern. That shows like a binary fractal on the left. It's something that comes out, or that you get when you get a number of consecutive series of consecutive numbers, you represent them in binary, and you place them one on top of the other. Then one is white, uh, two is black, or vice versa. So that means that it's very likely there may be the field of a header, for instance, identifying a package counter. This is very common. This is very frequent. This is like a sequence number, uh, whether you, or you name it. This tells me that I'm following the right direction, so there is no actual pattern. What may be happening here? Most likely, this is uh, likely to have gone through a scrambler. What is a scrambler about? Imagine IP traffic. So an IP header has many areas that are zero. Even in the application layer, it's very, very normal to send in packages with lots of bits that are zero. And this is bad when it comes to digital transmission, because when you model that, most likely this will generate a sequence of symbols of very many similar faces, and the recipient that at the end of the day is synchronized in the transition between faces, when it sees that the signal doesn't change, may get like really crazy, and by the time there will be a change of face, will not display it correctly, and it will find an error. So to avoid all that, the whole uh, bit stream, a short uh, operation is applied on a random noise of bits based on the number of, well, sounds polynomials, and then we eliminate all the zeros, and then we achieve quite a high entropy. So therefore, recipients or receptors like that. That is easy to do whenever you know what's underlying the signal, but when you don't have that information, that is not the way it is. So in a context of non-cooperation, so you, the only thing that you know that there is high redundancy in the signal, lots of very many similar bits. Someone has introduced a scrambler to, a scrambler to balance all that. Well, remember that this is not encryption, because the idea is not to hide information, but just to add entropy. But it could be similar to encryption. But what happens? When that happens, you are in trouble. But then what I did it was just to did IFS are intruder. So it computes the cross correlation of all the sequences generated by several irreducible polynomials. So this calculation is accelerated by using FFT, W3 libraries. 
and then the Fourier transformations. This would allow me to find where most likely that sequence has been applied. If I find the right point or the right place where the pseudo-random sequence is applied, I expect to find that the number of zeros and one is very much out of balance. When that happens, there is a significant peak in the DF component and it warns me that something is happening, is going wrong. And this is what happens, what is behind all that. Then I take action on the threads that I have extracted through self-correlator. The problem is if we get the, oh no, the, whenever he, the polynomial that shows the highest number of time in the same position is the one who is the candidate. So this is what it actually does, does many testing with very many polynomials. It takes longer. It takes shorter than you may think. These are the number of hits. This is the best offset. And this is the best match, a number of hits. And then it applies this sequence to all the strings. And then when I show this, I see that something has been changed. And I see that we see a big black block. And you may notice that at the beginning of the image, there are a number of black lines that we couldn't see before. This is an excess of zeros that a scrambling tried to correct. And when I see that, and I say, oh, I think I got it right. But even more interesting than that is that you may notice that more button down, this pattern of black lines disappears. Because I had this capture in the loop, it started halfway through the string. So therefore, no synchronizing with the scrambling sequence, and then it took it like if it were noise. So, but, but I'm interested in the part which is synchronized. OK, therefore, I believe that. And now we have the additive scrambler. And now, how do I validate on that? Well, by using the RPT chop. I take the high RPT standard. I detect the synchronization sequence. And then I read all the information. APG, and then the output is an image. There is a part of the code which is part of the standard that I could have detected or inferred from the techniques that I mentioned before. But I jumped through it because it, it already documented. And because we know that it is an LRTP, we know that it is a systematic EEC code. And then now we have our jigsaw puzzle completed scrambling, modulation, uh, bit rates, convolutional, etc. And why do I know that this is working? When I send that in, then a number of strings are found, very similar things or reasonable things. When I recompose or recompile the information, I get two images of the coastland in Holland, which is uh, similar to those in Spain. So, victory. Pero. <laughs> but. Pero. A ver, eh, a ver, averiguar la frecuencia, eh, es fácil. So finding out the frequency is an easy thing to do in those bands. However, if we think about Attacking the microwave bands of uh, satellites is just possible because here we have type hatch antennas and other type of antennas whose dimensions and size are not uh, related. Patch type antennas, it is just impossible to find out about the frequency. In a more realistic scenario, well, I wanted to ensure that I was using the same antenna that they were using, but in practical terms, that may not be it. I may have less information. So therefore, in that case, using a log periodic antenna would be better because they have high impedance, etc. And I said, well, OK, I have this. I want to learn how to uh, bend copper and all that. And that's what I did it. And now. I'm cheating here. I knew that that was LRPT, but do not expect to find LRTP 
PT in practice. You may know nothing about it. Here you have to use your genius. This is more a ha handcraft area. So here you will need to find some type of repetition. If I see that every eight bits I have a zero bit, I may go and say, oh, perhaps there is printable text there. Or a more tricky way to do that would be out of the whole sequence of bits. We should try to read IP strings and to see whether the check fits in. And then I say, well, there may be a package here. And now CC Crap assumes that there are no errors. Well, that doesn't happen. We know that. So if there are errors, you input in CC Crack, and then it goes like really, really mad. It tells you that the range of the bits that you're receiving is much, much wider. However, Marisan and Valenbois have analyzed the case with errors, and they have mechanisms to detect linear redundancy in the bit based on soft decisions with a certain uh, threshold of certainty. IFS intruder assumes that there is a significant lack of balance between zeros and units. In many cases, they are not ciphered. In com this world of uh, communications, there is lots of darkness. A few years ago, uh, an interesting thing happened. Iridium people said, our satellite communication system is secure for any attacker who is not fully motivated. And then those at the CCC, they said, I'm motivated. And then they started to capture and capture strings, conversations, images, everything. I recommend you watch the video. The work carried out by these people it has been just impressive. The multiplicative case is a priori the easiest. I took a signal with a scramble in it because it is the most complicated case because you have to do self-correlations. If it were multiplicative, a scrambler, you those codes are self-synchronizing. No matter when you apply them, you will get an scrambled sequence. And the ECC codes are, do not have to be necessarily systematic. Very likely, despite everything, you will get to see original bits also at the output. And none of these uh, that I told you works with LDPC or Turbo codes. codes. Madison and his friends were investigating on that, and surely or hopefully they will publish papers very soon. What I will do with this? Do you remember Suskan? This big button. With everything I've learned, my plans are to go to Suskan and to enter a menu that says break, and that I get all that immediately. But for that, I need time. And I really need people who love DSP and programming C and Signal. You all love that, isn't it? Well, when you want to collaborate, OK, so please contact me on GitHub. It will take time, for sure, because Suscan is terrible nowadays because of JTK, which makes it very slowly. And I'm trying to fine tune it to make it more agile so and to improve the user experience. And well, this is all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Please ask your questions in the mic. OK, I have a question, Gonzalo. Your friend, the friend who went in all Holland, uh, captured info with antenna, did he only capture information on Meteor? Well, the thing is that this person doesn't say whom he is. I think he's a Russian guy. 
I feel he's a Russian guy because when you visit the RTP sites, you get to see it, not only the sample but links to Russian uh, sites. So very many Russian things that you get there. I feel he's Russian. I'm not certain, but I am very sure that he has uploaded very, very many things. You visit that site and you will get to see, you will find very many things. So thank you very much. Very interesting. Any questions? Well, I have another question. Can you think about an easy way to run SUSCAN under Android or with RPM in a Raspberry or so that it runs in a remote server? I have compiled SUSCAN in the Raspberry and it works. I didn't mention it. SUSCAN runs on a library that I wrote some time ago, which is a framework Cibutis, to process the signal. It generates a radio, a radius, which is more usable, so to speak. And then it does many things for you. Running it under Android, well, in principle, there will not be a problem. We have to use the famous NDK. The only problem there would be to create an interface. That is not a problem because Suscan, we have a decoupled uh, graphical interface from the other interface. But again, it's a question of time. Question over there. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for your presentation, which is just impressive. My question is, you mentioned the thing about the fines if you listen out to signals. What about the law enforcement agencies or whoever is interested in finding out that you are breaching the law? How would they know for you to know that you are listening the signal? I know that they can find you capturing the signal but not listening to the signal. Well, that's very interesting. They cannot do it. The law is absurd. It is just absurd. But I feel that this all starts from a misconception of the electro spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. They feel that it is like the inside of an envelope. When you start to look into things that are not related or associated to you, that becomes really illegal. What happens that in practice, if you want to do bad, you will not be you wouldn't mind that at all. But, however, if they were to use all techniques, techniques used at the time of the Franco, at the time there were some radio emissions that were questionable, for instance, Pirenaica radio. So if any agent suspected that someone may be listening to Pirenaica radio, they set up a receptor that was looking for the intermediate frequency of the radio set. So they were tuning Pirenaica radio internally. The radio would be emitting in specific frequency. I'm listening here. And then a couple of officers would come to you saying hello, this and that. Nowadays, I don't think that that would could happen. There is lots of noise, and I don't think no one is interested in spending money in there. So these things are kind of overlooked because it is just unfeasible unless you are doing something really, really big. But as you can imagine, an SDR, who would catch me? I'm not inviting anyone to breach the law. Of course not, OK? If you do it, OK, it's a, run, it's a risk that you run, OK? Congratulations for your presentation. What made you decide on analyzing the RTP string rather than other with the wider spectrum? Well, RTP, as I mentioned before, because it is slower, it is easier for me to have a receptable scenario and it is more difficult for errors to appear. But it is also interesting because HRTP works in 3 megabytes per second. So therefore, having a radio with a flat response in the spectrum 
over three megabytes is quite complicated. But at the same time, if you get a hacker ref you, to create an actual disaster, it seems that the continuous component that you cannot eliminate appears right in the middle of the spectrum. So it could be very, very complicated. Whereas if it is 72 kilohertz of uh, wave, I'm not asking you or telling you to do it or encouraging you to do it, but anyone could do it. Second question. In the code, it seems that you are analyzing as well as working with the front end. Why don't you isolate it? Because that you could use JTK or any other. Oh, right, no, it allows you to do the two things. You may do cold and hot analysis. So for instance, if you are analyzing shortwave, lots with lots of emissions in eight uh, PSK, if you are there, spend half an hour capturing and then the CPU is not being used, doesn't really make sense. You select the device, the uh, sound car. No, but it says separated processes, create a server through IPC, and then you connect it as you like. You render it with HTML and with you name it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Well, the thing here, well, you could do that. Web SDR sites, you may be aware of it. They offer something which is really cool. It's Suscan ID, it is live spectrum, and then the signal is downloaded live. But that's a different story. I would love to do it. I would love to do it. It's not a bad idea at all. Actually, it's a very clever, very interesting. Running it under Android would be just wonderful. But as I say, it's a question of time. Okay, the question we're all making ourselves is your Russian friend, that guy in Holland, who was in Holland, obviously he was in listen mode, but I understand there's a protocol in which you can interact with a satellite. Of course, that satellite also doesn't have transponders, but antennas that receive on the X-band, up with which having the right hardware and the right frequency, you can say, hey, activate this, hey, deactivate that, hey, get into this area that, funny enough, doesn't have any password because nobody expected that this. So with a satellite, so we're all happy with this. It could be done. Do you think your friend, your Russian friend in Holland could provide you some material to give another presentation next year. I may, why do you want to see me in jail, Roman? I would love to do that, but why do you want to get me into prison? Maybe the legal department of Rutedcom will uh, intervene on your behalf. <coughs> Apart from satellites, have you thought about other devices such as a remote controlled car that is a lot a lot further away than a satellite that it's easier and it is extremely <laughs> illegal extremely I tell you why remote control cars usually work in FM band for scientific industrial use these band have power limitations irradiating power, polyvalent radiated power. So if you take and you start to broadcast on 30 megahertz, at 1,000 watts, really intense, you might get a public official saying, excuse me, this is not a citizen's band. This is a band used by lots of devices with little power who oh, you've been driving crazy in an area of maybe several miles around you. So it's like, excuse me, I mean, you can't do it. But these communications of electrical cars, for instance, if the toys are fine, if we're talking about something else, I'm talking about others that are further away than satellites. Oh, moon rovers and things like that. Oh, yeah, sure. That is really interesting because it's like a double problem. You think about in the uh, opportunity and all these. 
Well, I wasn't talking about the other side of the moon, but you won't have legal coverage of any type on, on the other dark side of the moon. This is so illegal and at so many levels that I can't, I can't even start explaining it. Let me see. Let's list the levels of uh, law infringement. You have to broadcast in a band in which you haven't got an authorization with a monstrous power. You won't have a radio telescope at home where it can be directed as efficiently. You will just use a cheap uh, antenna that will broadcast all over the place, disturbing everybody, absolutely everybody. Oh, for listening, he's saying, not to broadcast. No, obviously that is illegal, but to, for listening in, well, it's illegal in the sense well, there's a guy who in uh, Stockholm last year mentioned that he had a DSN at home. He had a number of parabolic antennas with which he could follow uh, NASA satellites that were just uh, uh, put in orbit. There was a very interesting case of a Russian, a Russian guy who had started to analyze a satellite that was very recently put into orbit. And you could see routes and lots of paths and lots of stuff, he could do the entire reversing thing. So you I mean you can do so, but you need really big antennas or arrays of antennas. You have to live outside of Madrid and have a huge amount of territory, put a, a huge array of uh, antennas, but and it's really expensive. Okay, we've got to start with the next presentation. Gonzalo, thank you ever so much.